are watching the futures here this morning after we saw that record close for the major averages yesterday. And as we close out 2020, and we've been looking at some of the trends that we have been watching. One of them has been ETF flows and where they have been going as we've seen stocks push to record highs. I want to bring in Torsten Slock. He is Apollo Global Management Chief Economist. Torsten, I know that there's a lot you're watching, but and this might seem like perhaps a, a more minor trend to some, but I'm really fascinated by it. You say retail investors have really been actively trading investment grade ETFs and high yield ETFs, so credit ETFs in other words. Um, what does that tell you? And you say they've been passive in equity e index ETFs. So that they sort of have let ride and they've ridden it up. What have we seen in terms of action in the credit ETFs? So it's an illustration of some of the challenges that we've had as investors through this year. I mean, a lot of the themes that have been successful have been more thematic issues. Uh, those are things, of course, that have been those that have been benefiting from the virus, if you will, and those that have been hurt by the virus. So this whole new factor of the virus coming in has had the implication that in equity markets, uh, it's been basically been relatively flat in terms of, uh, of passive, not doing uh, too much in terms of uh, trading things up and down, despite all the volatility. Whereas when the Fed very aggressively supported credit markets, we saw a very significant appetite, in particular among retail investors, but of course also in the broader credit market for supporting both investment grade credit and high yield credit. So from that perspective, the credit markets have just seen much more activity, uh, at least on the flow side, uh, relative to what we've seen in equities that have been more passive, because passive has been growing now for years and years. And, uh, and that's why the main theme underlying all this is really credit selection and stock selection, simply because of the way that uh, this shock, namely the virus, has been hitting uh, markets. And, and Torsten, building off that, you know, I'm I'm curious because the the equity market, and the credit market is is quite different in the sense that um, you know people who really want to own the actual instrument in the credit markets tend not to go to an, an an you know an instrument like an ETF to get that exposure. But when I'm looking at the data you sent over, I'm I'm almost wondering if this is you know a a fund manager or someone you know near the institutional side who says I can't actually get the bond I want. I can't get this actual coupon on my book. So I'm just going to have to find that exposure, you know, in the LQD, in, in the HYG, which is sort of what we're seeing. Is that something that you think might be happening? Yeah, so I do think absolutely that liquidity does matter a lot. I mean, for many years, we have talked about how little liquidity there is in corporate bond markets. And that's why if you want to be active, you really mainly have to buy the index uh, as a retail investor. Whereas in equities, you can buy individual stocks. And if you look at all the uh, stuff that has been around uh, uh, retail and, and households being very active in single name stocks this year, uh, that, of course, also tells you that a lot of activity and all the stuff that we have been discussing and you have been discussing, of course, also for now uh, uh, quite some time, all these issues around, well, it's just tech stocks have done incredibly well and the rest really have been doing quite differently. And I think that theme does indeed, to your good point, Miles, here, uh, link very closely with this issue of uh, how much liquidity is there in markets. But it comes on the back of this broader issue, again, that the thematic investing and what am I buying as an investor and what are the, 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 the themes that have been working and what are the themes that are recession proof? What are the themes that are not sensitive to the business cycle and where can I get exposure to that? Torsten, uh, anything you're seeing in the U.S. economy over the next three months, anything you're seeing, does that make sense relative to where stock valuations are? Yeah, so, I mean, Brian, that's a really good, that's, that's the number one question going into 2021. I mean, uh, there are three things in the very short term, namely stimulus, which you just spoke about. Then, of course, we have Georgia, which is another risk on the near-term horizon. And then in the very short term, of course, we also have Brexit. But those three things should all be resolved in the next few weeks. So with that backdrop, uh, we're going into 2021, where investors now have resolved some pretty significant topics that we've been debating, some of them for a very long time. And if we are now having those three issues against stimulus, Brexit, and what's going on with the Georgia runoffs, if that's all resolved, then we are back to looking at valuations and where valuations are at the moment. It is becoming more and more important to find asset classes such as uh, uh, ESG impact investing, thematic investing that really are less sensitive to the business cycle. And also, as you say, less sensitive to valuations because valuations are just so high, both on equities overall with the multiple of the S&P 500 being 
being high, and also credit spreads, in particular investment grade and high yield, still being relatively low. Again, speaking to the theme of thematic credit selection and thematic investing becoming a, a broader issue as we go into 2021. Torsten, I want to dig into those themes for just a moment, and I want to ask you about ESG um, in in particular, because we've been talking a lot about that issue yes, uh, lately, and there does seem to be a lot of interest around it. However, in terms of where it is in its life cycle, it's still sort of difficult to get your arms around it, right, in terms of transparency, in terms of definition, in terms of you know, is stuff that says it's ESG really ESG? And what does that even mean? So what do you think is going to characterize that wave as we start to see its maturation a little bit, perhaps as we get into 2021? And just want to mention, we're seeing that Golden Falcon um, SPAC ring the opening bell on the NYSE today. And we're going to speak, be speaking to one of the heads of that in just a few moments. But Torsten, um, tell me your thoughts on ESG here. Yeah, so you're right. I mean, one way to look at it is to look at it from a demand perspective and a supply perspective. On the demand side, it's very clear that there is a long, long list of very good reasons why investing in ESG is a very good idea. And it's certainly also clear that globally, not least in real money managers and institutional community, there is more and more interest in looking at ESG assets, not only in the US, also in Europe, also in Asia. So from that perspective, it's clear that there's a lot of demand for buying ESG assets. On the supply side, you're right. Um, there are various ways of doing this and there are various ways of designing uh, ESG products. And there's certainly the case, as you're saying, that you, you do look at, in some cases at uh, ESG assets and have a debate about uh, to what degree is this what you normally would think about uh, something that falls into the ESG category. But broadly speaking, both with significant demand on the uh, real money side or investor side, and also uh, on the uh, also growth in ESG assets available, uh, but broadly speaking, the general trend that uh, all corporates are moving in that direction uh, certainly does uh, speak for at least uh, paying a good deal of attention going forward to still ESG assets and thematic investing, and also impact funds that also are focusing on uh, not only, of course, generating good returns, but also doing good at the same time. So there's a lot of new dimensions that are blossoming and popping up that are becoming very important for for investors to look at, again, as we look at these very, very high valuation situations that we have both in equities and corporate bond markets at the moment. You know, Torsten, when you talk about credit markets, of course, uh, inflation concerns are, are always right next door. We heard from the Fed earlier this week. Jay Powell certainly doesn't seem concerned about that. An idea that I'd love to ask you about, which has gotten more play in the last couple of weeks, is, is this idea that um, Fed policy effectively gets easier if they do nothing, but we see a, a steepening in, in, in the yield curve and we see um, you know, the market react to some inflationary dynamics, but we see the Fed do nothing against those dynamics. How, how are you thinking about a potential inflation scare next year? And uh, again, I think a market assumption that the Fed is going to look through it and not move at all. I know, Miles, and you and I have talked about this for many years, but the way that I think about this still is that uh, I mean, one way that you normally think about inflation is that companies have pricing power. In other words, companies feel that there's so much demand for the goods that they're selling that they now have some pricing power that they can raise the prices of the goods on the market. We are not in that situation at the moment with an unemployment rate at 6.7. We're still far behind in terms of jobs that need to be created. Remember, we're still 10 million jobs in total employment lower today than where we were in February. So I do not see much demand inflation because we're just not in a situation with full employment as the Fed would like to see in the dual mandate. We're just not in a situation where demand inflation is strong enough to provide that boost to inflation. The second type of inflation is cost inflation. This is a little bit more worrying. The dollar has been going down. And remember, when the dollar goes down, import prices go up. And when import prices go up, that means that things become more expensive that we're buying in shops that are imported from abroad. So we could see some import price inflation. We could see some inflation coming from the dollar going down and also from commodity prices going up. So we're caught in this little bit difficult situation that I do not believe we'll see inflation because of an overheating economy in 2021. But there are some risks that inflation could go up because simply it becomes more expensive with commodity prices going up, become more expensive to produce. And also with the dollar going down here gradually, and it is all under control and, and in an orderly manner. But still uh, the dollar depreciating is something that at least in the 
traditional Phillips curve and the traditional equation of what price inflation has been putting some upward pressure on inflation. So I think the Fed, it makes sense what Jay Powell was saying this week, that um, we do not see inflation as a problem. But I still think that we should be monitoring this cost component with supply chain constraints, all these issues, commodity prices going up and the dollar going down, potentially putting some upward pressure on some components of inflation over the coming quarters. Torsten, uh, in many respects, my year started wa walking the floors with you back in Davos in January, which feels so long ago. But what investment lessons have you learned since then, and, and how are you going to apply them to, to uh, next year? Yeah, I mean, the shock that we got, as we know all too well, of course, was completely uh, unpredicted and no one had foreseen that this would be coming in 2020. So it tells you that when you construct your portfolio, you need to, of course, uh, very uh, simply speaking, you need to hunt yield. I mean, you, it's, it's expensive to just sit in cash and not be part of the market. And the question then becomes, what do I do when valuations, I mean, when we were talking like six months ago, the conversation was very different relative to where valuations are today. That's why I think that it is really more the thematic challenges around your portfolio construction, thinking about what are the themes, what are the recession-proof things that are uncorrelated with the high valuations we're seeing in equities, that are uncorrelated with the tight credit spreads we're seeing in investment grade at the moment. And those are two things that are, again, thematic investing, and that is, again, credit selection and stock selection, picking those that you think will be the winners and having some portfolio that you put together that will be, of course, always somewhat vulnerable to what the business cycle and the economy is doing, but try to pick something that will be less sensitive to what the business cycle is doing, something that's more long-term structural winning topics and themes that could be doing well almost no matter what environment we might be getting from markets or from the economy. Yes, business night cycle agnostic. Torsten, it is always great to talk to you. I know it's been a big year for you as well, and we always appreciate your insight. Torsten Slock, Apollo Ma Global Management Chief Economist. Thanks again, Torsten.